Hello everyone, I'm Stephanie Boozer with CGC HQ. Welcome to today's user share webinar with Owen Reynolds. Um, before we dive in, just want to make you aware of a few events that we have coming up and I have a link in the chat for you to our events calendar. Um, lots of local group meetings that we have still going on. Um, I think this week we have Portland and Seattle. Um, we also have got web webinars on the calendar. Tomorrow we have one with Liquid Wear. So if you are interested in their Stratosphere UX product, you can join us for that tomorrow. Um, and then coming up soon is a DevOps webinar with um, Pat Patterson. He's been doing a lot of uh, automation webinars with us, um, Pat's with Citrix, and everyone has been really interesting and really unique. So looking forward to that too. And then obviously we have our CDC XL Northeast event coming up in just another month and less than a month really. Um, so hope you'll join us for that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna get us going if I can get my mouse cursor to show up. There we go. <laughs> so you are here today to talk about some best practices for sustainable Citrix implementations. And um, we all like to go on vacation and take a break. So I think some of what you're going to hear today is going to allow you to hopefully do that without being bothered. Um, but before we jump in, just a reminder that we are recording today's presentation and uh, you will get a link to the recording tomorrow. That email is gonna come from GoToWebinar directly, so be on the lookout for that. Also, we'd like you to type in your questions as you have them. The format of today is um, very free flowing. Um, Owen's going to do a lot of discussing. There's not a, it's not a big PowerPoint deck. Um, he's gonna go through the points that he laid out in his blog, and I have a link for that um, in the chat for you as well. So what he would like to do is kind of take your questions as you have them, so please type them in um, throughout. He wants, he wants to be interrupted and he wants to answer your questions today. Um, and finally, I'll have a short survey for you at the end as I usually do, um, so make sure you fill that out. All right, so we have Owen Reynolds. He is a Citrix technology advocate. Hello, Owen. Hello. And uh, helping us out with all of your questions, because I know you're probably going to have a ton, right, um, is Lee Jeffries. He is a CTP. Hello, Lee. Good afternoon, morning, evening. I do. <laughs> All right, Owen, I'm gonna turn my camera off and disappear so that you're the star of the show and I will send you the screen. Um, I know you don't have any slides, but it'll be there ready for whenever you'd like to share something. All right, I gotta update that uh, picture. That haircut was was no good. I don't know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I had the pandemic, I guess it was a pandemic haircut, so. Okay, let me uh, let me know when you guys can see my screen. Should show the blog post on the left. Yep, I see it. All right, cool. So yeah, I'm Owen. I'm in uh, Montreal, um, Canada, and uh, I work for iti.ca. So this blog post is inspired by my experience returning to a client that I had to leave last year. Um, so in my job. I do consulting for, I'm a permanent employee of this company, but I do consulting for lots of different clients um, throughout the year, uh, sometimes three in the same week, sometimes one a month, like it, it depends. But um, I did have the fortunate experience to have to, 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 I was able to return to a client that I had left. So they, they weren't able to keep me on and I wasn't able to finish everything that I wanted to do. But when I came back, they hadn't deleted my OneNote entry or my, any of my Wikipedia stuff and all that stuff was in place. So I was basically able to come back and pick up right where I left off, which, which was really cool. And I also got to see um, the things that worked while I was gone, like the sustainable parts of the PowerShell code I wrote or the you know GPOs that I set up with my coworker, um, John, Jonathan Petrie, I work with him and all the other different things that me and him had worked together on, um, I got to see what was working and what wasn't. And for the most part, everything everything worked, um, which I was really happy about. So I thought about, okay, well, this could happen again. I could have to exit a client early and I won't get a chance to, you might not, I might not work with them again. And then all they have is the code I wrote them, the schedule tasks I set up, the documentation by whatever, um, 
method that was the meetings I held with them to, to, to hand things off to their operations staff, to their help desk and whatnot. And I, but that's just, that's just me. That's just the way I work. And I thought, well, it would be interesting to, to have a discussion with other people about how they do their implementations and, and, and the idea of thinking about doing an implementation that a client can use when you're gone. So this presentation, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say it's only applicable for the people who are doing consulting because some of the stuff, uh, I have this dirty dozen list <laughs> that I'll go through, and some of it um, does actually cover things that I ran into when I, uh, when I used to work for the financial industry. So, so my, I've been in IT for 21 years and um, 18, let me see, 18 of those years have been working for very, very large financial institutions. So, so that, that, that means that um, I'm used to working in places that are highly regulated and, and have a lot of change management. So that brings me to my first example of something that, um, another thing that got me started on this particular topic, which is what I call the bus test. So if you read my, my blog post, it's, it's a bit morbid, but I did have a situation um, in the year 2014, when I was working for RBC, RBC went um, full ITIL, if you guys are familiar with ITIL, where you have a very regimented like end-to-end -end change management process. And that means that you have to fill out a lot of digital paperwork to get change records approved and into production. So at that time, I was, um, I was doing some work without change records and some some with an older change management record system. And the company had upgraded to um, Hewlett Packard Service Manager 9, which if anyone has ever worked with it, it's, um, it's a great product, I suppose, but it has uh, an infinite number of fields that you can fill out for change jurisdiction and risk and all this kind of stuff. And I wasn't really used to it. So I wanted to make a change in production and I wanted to do it with some MS-DOS batch file that I'd wrote. It was very nice. It was a very, you know, it was reasonably well tested. Um, it was reasonably well documented um, and it worked and I had tested it in the dev environment. <laughs> but, uh, when it came time to, to get the, the change record approved for production, every time I submitted the change, it would get rejected. So I was getting frustrated and, and I was receiving notification of the rejections via email. So I'm sure for the, the people that are listening, you maybe had the experience where you're having a heated discussion with someone over, this was before instant message was really popular, but you know, you're having a heated discussion with someone over instant message or email and uh, it's not going well. So what do you do? You call, right? You have to talk to them on the phone, right? So that's that's exactly what what I did with this guy I was working with and it was the same person who kept rejecting my change record over and over again was very annoying. So I talked on the phone, he said, look, uh, oh, and I want to approve this change record because it's important you get this done, you make this change on the file server, but your change record doesn't pass the bus test. Bus test, not bus dead, bus test, bus test. So you can see on my screen, bus test, right? So what is the bus test? The bus test is literally a fatality. So I, at the time I was living in Winnipeg, I looked both ways before crossing the street. I, at that time, I wasn't wearing noise isolating headphones if I was outside. The, the odds of me getting hit by a bus are very low, um, but that there is still a chance that I could be preparing for a change record on Tuesday and get hit by a bus um, in the morning and, and not be able to hand off the work to a coworker. And that's exactly what he said. Owen, if you're down and out, if you're in the hospital, or you're on crutches or traction or whatever, could you hand off your work to anybody else on your team? And with some embarrassment, I had to say to, to the guy, no, the only one that can execute this change is me. I was the only one that knew the code because I wrote it, even though it's like batch code, it's still code. I was the only one that knew the process, how you monitor it, how you did the, the post implementation verification. So it was like I had created my own support issue. So the only, if, I, if I'm the only one that can execute it, if I'm the only one that understands it, then that's not sustainable because I could quit, I could get let go, or I could get sick, or I could get hit by a bus. So when he told me that, I 
I do have a habit sometimes of talking when people are telling me things that I don't understand and I should shut up. But in this, in this case, I just listen and I said, hey, Michael, that was the guy's name. You're totally right. I cannot pass off this change record to anybody else on my team, even though there's plenty of people on my team who are competent, even more competent than me. So what did I do? I thought about the other person. I thought about who was going to execute this change with me gone. Not that I'm so morbid and thinking about getting hit by a bus, but though I have seen all of the Final Destination movies. But I thought about, you know, how am I going to pass this off? And what does that mean? It means I have to do better testing and I have to do a better job of recording the test results and I have to do a better job of documenting the end-to-end -end process. So that's been informative to me um, from pretty much, I would say, the last seven years. Um, I think before that, working for the financial institutions, if you're working in a highly regulated environment, so like healthcare, military, government, provincial or federal governments, um, you know, finance, insurance, you know, you're going to be used to a fair amount of oversight into your work and change records and stuff like that. But you might not be, you you might also think about being not you might not think about being a gatekeeper, and how things will run or not run when you leave. So with that out of the way, that's the bus test. Obviously, I did not get hit by bus. I'm here talking. Um, I can still walk. So let's go. I'm going to go through um, a few of the classic scenarios that I have found um, frustrating for taking over somebody else's work or people have voiced frustrations from my own work and saying, oh, and I don't understand this and that. Um, yeah, so let's get, uh, let's get started. So the one of the, I would consider myself um, pretty competent with a few different things. One thing I would consider myself an absolute expert, <laughs> and maybe it's like a silly thing to be an expert on, is scheduled tasks. I am like, I don't know why I, but I just, have um, I have used scheduled tasks for so long? I know there is a future, or there's a future beyond scheduled tasks with Azure DevOps and whatnot. But I love scheduled tasks. <laughs> I'm always configuring scheduled tasks, and um, I have made some mistakes. So, for instance, what you can see on my screen right here, um, I have been in a situation uh, a few times, including with one of my more recent clients, where I've had to hard code in my own ID into a scheduled task. You should never do this. I mean, it's good from it's good from an auditing perspective because people know who configured it. But the problem with configuring a scheduled test with your own ID is anytime your password changes, you know that account is that scheduled task is no longer going to run. On top of that, um, it also creates uh, it can create another situation. Where let's say if you left the company, your account is disabled. That scheduled task stops, stops, stops running. So what do you want to do? I would say, you know, your best bet is to, for auditing, the auditing perspective, configure it with a limited service account or system, one or the other, but don't don't put in your own ID. Definitely not, yeah. Um, okay, so PowerShell is, I generally speaking, I'm using um, scheduled tasks to launch PowerShell scripts. I've used them in the past to launch like batch files and BBSs and stuff like that, but now it's all PowerShell. So PowerShell is an interesting topic. Um, this is why I would like to get you know, if people have feedback or questions on this particular point, which is point number two of the of the Dirty Dozen, I love PowerShell. I use it all the time. Uh, I use it for, you know, managing my file server at home, um, for cleaning up files, for sending emails, for doing daily health checks on my lab. Um, I do love it, but I also selfishly love it because I've taken the time. I took some courses in 2015. I'm not trained as a formal programmer, so there's still elements of of PowerShell, which is which is part of the Microsoft.NET C# -sharp family. Obviously, you can you know you can tell when someone like Guy Guy Leach is an example. I make, made a mention of him in my blog post. Like as far as I know, he's one of the only formal formally trained programmers in the EUC um, space. So he takes for granted um, code hygiene and GitHub and and all that kind of stuff. Um, but for some people, you know, it's I think it's important to to keep your code uh, short, sweet, well documented, or so, or don't use it. In some cases, like I've I've been in, um, there's been some clients where I I haven't wanted to give them a fully automated solution because I didn't think they would be able to handle the code changes after I was gone. You know that's that's something to uh, keep in mind. 
um, in my example here, this is this is a perfect example. Okay, so I have on the left tab here, you can see a, a VMware health check. Okay, so this is run. I run this on my um, my local lab every day. The version one of the script had bad error checking, so it wasn't exiting out. It wasn't taking into account certain environments where you'd have constraints on installing VMware Power CLI or, or Nugget or dependencies. And so when I released it, I put it on GitHub and I shared it and nobody said anything. And then I got some feedback from a coworker who said, oh, it doesn't work for this environment. And, and that's one of the things about <clears throat> PowerShell. You, you, some, you should think about it as like, I'm sharing this with experts, I'm sharing this with intermediaries, and I'm sharing this with users, or I'm sharing this with junior admins, senior admins, like you really don't know who's gonna download your stuff. And if it doesn't work, they might not even tell you. <laughs> my, my coworker who worked for me, uh, he said, oh yeah, I tried to run it at this client and it didn't work. And so, you know, I was fortunate, but think about um, commenting your code Think about testing it with Pester. I have a little bit of experience with Pester. Um, obviously, you want to do code hygiene checks with uh, Visual Studio Code if you're uploading to GitHub. Um, but also think about just keeping the code simple. Like if you don't need to load a module or use a function or pull in some extra third-party stuff, don't do it. Um, because if you're thinking about leaving that script with the client, they they more than likely they won't be able to maintain it if they need to make a change, or if they find it confusing, they might not use it at all. It's, that's entirely pot. That does that does happen, yeah. Um, and then I just make a quick note here on point number two, document the purpose of the script. So me, I, I always use a synopsis type header, so you know I can look at this type of format. I'm not gonna go through this with you guys, but uh, you know, basically you just you just put in comments, change management, that type of stuff, and then try to sync that to whatever is in your uh, your GitHub next. Um, so yeah, I guess a bit of a shameless plug. The the health check scripts that I, I spoke of, I do have those on my GitHub. You can read them in my blog post. I, I have one that, that does like a generic health check to check uptime and when the last time um, you had a, a PC that was patched or rebooted or, or to check uh, vSAN data stores and stuff like that. That's something you can use and it's on my GitHub. You can easily repurpose it for your clients if you want. A little bit more advanced one I wrote recently, which is here, which is for VMware environments. So this is kind of based on what I would say the dirty six for VMware environments, um, which is uh, hosting hosting and vCenter type issues you, you can have where you've got your, your do it, you've, the client or someone else has set up things against best practices uh, where you didn't, well, for instance, here, my vSAN witness, the NTP service has stopped. Obviously, you want that to be up and running. Uh, you want to have your VMware shells at a later har hardware version. Um, you obviously want to be patched up as high as you, I go as high as I can pretty much with, uh, with vCenter. You can't always do that for every clients, um, other clients. Here I've tagged a uh, single VM in my, I've got about 30 VMs at home and one of them is on an older version of VMware tools, so I have to update that. Uh, this one's on an older version of the legacy um, SAS controller. And I've got a single virtual witness, which is not set to high performance. So you can run this script for my GitHub. It takes, um, if you want to get full performance metrics, some extra measures here. It's a function I pulled in from, uh, from another person. It takes about, it takes about two minutes for, uh, you know, small environments. Larger environments can take up to five minutes, but that's, that's something you could do. Let's say a day one, you're going into a client. You can, you can, uh, you can go in and you can run that and you can give some, basic topographical information about their environment. Now, keep in mind, as I'm saying this, this also is butting up against um, my point above. So if you if the client is not comfortable with PowerShell, then you might not wanna give them a, a scheduled task or a script that they're not gonna be able to maintain. If their vCenter server, vCenter server name changes the Nutanix host or whatever, um, that, you know, you have to make these, consider, these considerations before you release code, like I say here, any code you give them, like me, I mean, I don't know about you guys, you can you can answer in the chat if you want. I put my name on everything. Um, yeah, so I try to be transparent. That's me, Owen Reynolds, and then my blog. And, you know, I usually put in my company email address while I'm working for the client, or I put in my personal email address. I have never been emailed to this day. I don't think so. Maybe once after I left Royal Bank, 
in 2017. But then I just said, just read the docs. <laughs> so they said, hey, how does that thing you do, how does it work? And I was like, oh, that still works. Yeah, it should work. It's on a service ID that has, you know, 365 days of use. And uh, just read the doc. Because I, I had a health check script, but in the health check script, I linked to the doc, which explained how it worked. So like, oh, okay. So I wasn't mean about it. But yeah, to this day, I, I rarely get questions. Um, it's not that I'm the best at PowerShell, but I'd say my strength is documenting. I write stuff down. I write stuff down for my own benefit. I'm getting older. I forget things. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just good practice. So I definitely, my PowerShell code is documented up the yin-yang, um, similar to anything else that I do. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, all right, so health check, GPOs. Um, I haven't seen this in a while, but yeah, if you if you do if you're doing a, an audit for an environment or you're coming into a client, if you set up GPOs that are for testing and you call them test, TST, TST, UAT, PIV, at some point get rid of them, mark them for deletion, set yourself a reminder, something like that. Like you know you don't because otherwise, if you're the expert, you're the consultant the client should be expecting you to clean up your own mess on your way out, right? You know, do your own dishes. So get rid of those GPOs. You're not using them anymore. Um, another thing, this one I got from my coworker, John Petrie. I don't think he's on the call today. I actually did not use to document the individual elements of GPOs and GPPs, which you can do. You can actually put in links to CTX articles, Microsoft articles, et cetera, blog posts. That's a good one because you guys are working with Citrix. You know, there's a hell of a lot of reg keys that Citrix does document. Sometimes they change the KBs and you get a 404 not found. Um, but it's a good idea to document why you're applying a change, uh, especially GPOs um, and GPPs, because, you know, you, you could have a setting that you put in place. Um, I've done this as well for the, my last client. I put a setting in and I put a time bomb on it. I said, okay, I only want to run this for six months. It was a GPP to delete some shortcuts and then after a while, I'm like, okay, I, obviously I don't need this anymore. Let's get rid of it, right? So um, that's that's a good thing to do. Definitely, you know, like I said here, I've got, you know, remove debt, date, et cetera, et cetera, link to it, yeah. Um, this one, uh, to be honest, like if you guys have ideas. I don't actually have a good idea on how to, like Joe Shank talked about this on one of his talks a couple of months ago, um, which is, where you are continuing to apply registry keys and best practices and whatnot that actually are no longer relevant, you know, like disabling IPv6 or, you know, there's just, there's, there's hundreds of registry keys that Citrix has given us or Microsoft and Citrix and VMware. Um, good example, TCP IP scalability pack settings, right? So it used to be classic turn off RSS, right? Nobody's got dual core, you know, and then fast forward five or six years, you know, You've got multiple VPUs, physical cores. Now you want to enable all of those features, but there's probably lots of environments. And my coworker, John, did discover this in a few environments, some of our clients. They were still disabling features that were working against them. So I put this open to anyone who has a good idea. I don't actually know. <laughs> like, I can't think of a way. Like, it's almost like we would have to have an annual review you know, to to confirm if this fix is still relevant. I don't know. And sometimes I don't actually even know the answer, even if I'm, even if it's just two people talking, right? So that's an interesting thing. If anyone has any ideas on, on this one, I, I'm talking like I'm the expert. I don't know. I honestly, there's, you know, technology changes, vendors, the big three we work with, Microsoft, VMware, and Citrix, they fix things. And that means that you should be revisiting things that they fixed and remove the workarounds, right? So same with my next point here. Um, make sure that you you have some type of review process. I worked for, when I was working for Royal Bank, you had a maximum time limit that you could put in uh, for PRPs, problem resolution procedures. So you could go in and you could say, okay, you have to run this registry script or this command line fix but they wanted you to review it every 12 months and then figure out a way to make that workaround go away, make it permanent so that users didn't have to do it at all, right? which makes sense. So I haven't worked in an environment that has mandated um, reviews of problem resolution procedures in a while, but at the time 
it was kind of jarring. I remember seeing that. I was like, oh, now I have this like extra work for me to do. But I, I actually don't mind. I think it's a good idea um, because if you think about just like this previous point, if you're gumming up your MCS or PVS golden image with registry keys that are 11 years old that are no longer required, um, when are you going to review them? You know, and so maybe some part of your organizational process will force you to do that, which I think is is a good thing. Okay, so this one is also open to discussion. So the next pieces are going to be my own kind of person. I think the, some of the stuff I've covered so far is like, I don't know why anyone would argue it. If you want to argue with me, you can. But this next bit is a little bit more personal. Um, and this also comes down to, especially when we get to this point here, it comes down to the experience of the client. Uh, Lee, are there any uh, questions so far? Uh, nothing so far, mate. Nope. Okay, so we're going on to this one. Okay, so this is, if you're coming into a, a new environment, you're standing up a new Citrix installation, standard, you know, CVAD, LTSR, 1912 LTSR, or, you know, on-prem or, or cloud or whatever, you're going to have to make, you're going to have to make some decisions. And one of the first things you're going to have to do is how you're going to, you know, deliver the user experience. Um, my own personal experience with WEM uh, thus far has not been um, super great. I haven't had uh, an implementation where I was leaning on WEM for 100% of the, the user experience. So that's why I'm saying my, what I'm saying right now, I, I wouldn't, WEM wouldn't be my go-to um, for a, a new, a, a standing up a new installation because it introduces a new requirement. Um, if you're using a cloud-based one, then obviously you're not having to deal with the SQL backend or the, um, the actual WEM server, but even inside of that, you're still having, you still have to maintain a, a binary. You have to do the, uh, the the WEM client within your your golden image, um, like I said right here. So so that's something to consider. Um, but there is one thing that WEM, like I mentioned before, is is has a killer feature, which is the CPU and memory management, which I think you could probably do with Control Up with custom scripts and stuff like that. But um, WEM does it better. So for, for a couple of the clients I've got it out there for, I don't do too much of the user touch stuff, but I, I like it for the uh, the old school NorScale process and memory management stuff. It's, it's very good for that. So again, that's just a decision you would have to make with the client. Are they comfortable maintaining that component when you're gone? Um, is, it, is it worth you know the troubleshooting efforts when WEM doesn't work? Um, what's the impact of WEM not working for them? That type of thing. Um, App layering, um, same thing. So this is something that came from uh, a client I was working for where we had planned to use app layering and it didn't look to be sustainable. Um, and at the same time, FS Logics, so FS Logics, I'm sure many people are familiar with them. They offer um, three different killer features. One is the profile management, which is superior for you know encapsulating people's user settings and their office settings across the network in VHDX containers, which is really, really great. Um, and the other piece of that, which I find even more useful, is application masking. So with application masking, you can do kind of a quasi app layering where you can actually selectively hide or unhide um, program files, start menu, shortcuts on the desktop registry, all types of different things. And you can create what we did, me and John did for one of our clients, we created a universal image. The original envisionment, envisionment was to use app layering and mount applications um, on mount. And during the POC, we just found that it was, um, anyone who's ever worked with app layering, it, it has some some challenges with regards to um, the uh, splatting or the exporting process can, can be uh, quite um, long administratively. So we ended up using um, FS Logics app masking. So that's the decision you could make. Uh, other clients we have, very competent local admins and they're fully capable of handling app layering after we're gone. So you just kind of have to suss it out, see what your clients are capable of, if they're happy enough to, to maintain um, operating system layers, platform layers, application layers, and, and go through the export process every month and, and deal with that, uh, then they're good to go. Um, if, if not, then it may be a case to look at UPL, which is built into 1912 LTSR, or um, or FS Logic app masking. So again, this is this is like my own personal opinion, and and certainly um, people will have um, you know even if you saw Aaron Parker's post on uh, Twitter 
earlier this week, people have different opinions. Some people have very strong opinions in app learning. Um, PVS, MCS, I've worked with both about equally. I've probably worked with PVS maybe a little bit more. Um, I kind of am sold on MCS for the moment. I'm aware, you know, that we're looking at uh, there's we're looking at adding support to Citrix Cloud for the PVS for PVS, but PVS is a lot of work to get working, and um, it's it's you, you can definitely run into sustainability issues with PVS versus MCS in terms of firewall rules getting changed, um, dependencies on DHCP. Um, yeah, the network dependency is is challenging, um, and and uh, the administrative costs of of maintaining a separate uh, database and a separate studio, and then doing binary updates to each. These are all costly. They're costly in terms of time, um, and all that stuff is on prem. So you don't you don't have a path to the cloud today. Um, and and for some clients, you know, I didn't really make this a point of in my um, in terms of sustainability, but I'll say it now, and maybe I'll update the blog post recommending clients to go to Citrix Cloud if they don't have um, dedicated Citrix admin people, which is common. A lot of a lot of environments I work in, the Citrix men and women are infrastructure admins. They're not dedicated to Citrix. So what does that mean? That means that they have to do they have to get used to or train themselves up and all the things that we're used to as EUC people, all the registry keys and all the other stuff that I mentioned above. Um, but at the same time, they're having to deal with NetApp filers running low on space, you know, Cisco firmware updates like they, that may, may not be maybe part of their purview, but they might not want it to be. <laughs> so in that case, um, that may be a, a case. And, you know, I, I, sh I definitely will update my blog post that they're probably a, a candidate for Citrix Cloud. Then they've got their controllers. They've got their SQL in the cloud. They could even put their storefront. They could do their, you know, their NetScaler gateway as a service. You know, that that's that's definitely, you know, to me, Citrix Cloud can be a more sustainable solution administratively wise. It can it can cost more in some cases, but maybe what you you lose in, in money you gain back in time. So at the end you're 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 saving on staffing costs or overtime. Um, that's that's definitely a point of consideration. Uh, okay, so Coming close to the end here, I'm going to go into, yeah, so documentation, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm big on documentation, and I'd like to hear people's ideas on how they do documentation. What I do um, is I use Microsoft OneNote as my scratch, and then once I have finalized documentation, I'll give the client the choice to create a wiki in Teams, or I give them a Word doc. So Word doc to me is um, legacy, but some people don't, you know, they just prefer Word docs, that's fine. You know, you just give them the choice, but my input is always um, one note. So I take notes while I'm doing some stuff, and then once it's finalized, I, I put it somewhere else. So I'd be interested to know what other people, I think I posted on Slack um, last year, and I got, I actually think every single person answered something different. Um, and nobody said Teams Wiki, <laughs> so I kind of felt silly for using that. But yeah, there's. Um, I'm trying to think who are the companies that do documentation management. Um, Jira. I don't know. I, I, I'm def. I I'm good at writing documentation. The platforms to me are irrelevant. Um, we have a few questions if you want them. Yep. Yeah, go for it. So um, we've got one here. What about best practices services to monitor for? actual Citrix implementations. Um, we've had outages after a, an SQL update and didn't know LHC was broken. Is there a common list of event IDs, services to monitor for a for in a health check? Yeah, I had like a really good health check script um, for a client that I was working for a financial institution, but I was under NDA, so I couldn't export it. So LHC um, is an interesting, you're, they're, they're, are, this, are they talking about on-prem or, or cloud? Probably doesn't really matter not specific so yeah i actually my client i don't know if if um my client is on 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 the phone but um lhc errors are logged not directly um with with uh, the, your on-prem citrix brokers or through citrix cloud brokers they're actually logged through errors with the config sync service and with the high availability service so the high availability service if you want to monitor for issues where LHC is not working, you're going to want to monitor the high availability service error messages. They're um, 3055, 3054, they're all in the 3000 range under application. And basically, when your brokers 
um, tag an issue where like your LHC would be invoked obviously with, with 715 and above uh, when your SQL instance is offline. So, but Citrix doesn't, um, unlike with um, 6.5 and 4.5, they don't actually provide, I don't even think they have anything in the event ID metadata that says um, LHC issues. Everything is related to the, the um, high availability service and the config sync service. So if you want to, if that person, um, maybe I can send them an email. I can, I, I actually think I, I went back to Citrix for a KB um, from a couple of years ago, and I can I gave some feedback. So if they want to give me their email address or send me a personal message, I can um, I can follow up with them and, and and give them the event IDs to monitor. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to export my script from the client um, that was under um, because I was under NDA. But I, I have a good idea of how to uh, how to help with that. Next That's question. Cool. Uh, regarding GPIs, in addition to the comments on individual policies, do you still document? by exporting to HTML or Excel table. Uh, the format gets really wonky when copying from export HTML to Word. Yeah. Um, coming into an environment, I would use Carl's, Carl, um, Carl Webster's scripts to document. On the way out, I don't think, I think maybe I've been called, despite the fact I'm um, pretending to be an expert for this call, I actually, <laughs> I think this question has identified a, uh, a hole in my uh, my own method, and I, I should be using Carl's scripts on the way out. Yeah, I would definitely say if you're going to be if you are creating GPOs, and I'm a less is more type person, I don't like to create a GPO per setting. I, I like to have one for computer, one for user, and then one for security, and then maybe one miscellaneous one, like maybe four. Um, but that stuff is easy enough to export um, with with Carl's uh, Carl Webster scripts. Or just with the uh, the export view. Yeah, it's another one for me. I got to update my blog post. The, the question kind of called me outly. <laughs> no worries. Um, yep. Nutanix clusters in Azure are now supporting PBS with a cloud connector to mm -hmm. Citrix Cloud. Um, I don't think that was a question. It's more of a comment. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware. I think it's going in. I don't know. Is it? It's not GA though. It's just. Uh, are they fully supporting it? Or I haven't. I haven't, uh, I haven't really followed the story of PVS on Citrix Cloud, to be honest. But if they're doing it, great. Um, I wouldn't be, I'm not going to be a day one guy on that one. <laughs> nope. And here's a good one for you. Uh, pros and cons between UPM and FS logics. Uh, are they talking about UPM with the, the container um, encapsulation that they have from last year, or just straight UPM that isn't using VHDXs? Uh, yes. Oh, with the VHD? Answer. Okay. With, with so, both, both, both containerized, yep. Yeah. So I, I have a blog post on this. It's in draft. It's not completed. <laughs> so I started to write it last week. Um, I hope to have it. If I can get the person's name, I'll, I'll send them the link to the, um, the blog post. Um, I would be leaning just on this call, uh, um, not to ruin the surprise of the blog post, because it's going to be pretty quick. It's... Uh, I started to write the blog post when the new Mortal Kombat movie came out. So I watched the movie and I was inspired to, uh, I watched a bunch of the fatality videos or whatever. And uh, I said it was, you know, um, FS Logix container encapsulation versus uh, Citrix UPL with, with uh, VHDX encapsulation. I called it Mortal Kombat. Um, I would, I'm at this point, um, I am. I think I'm about two to one on my implementations with FS Logix versus versus the cloud container stuff. And the cloud container stuff, that's me working with my coworker. I didn't. Um, I wasn't fully involved in the setup. We we're kind of doing it together. Uh, I'm liking FS Logix a little bit more. The OneDrive support is better. Um, the uh, what's the other reason? Oh, the average file size. Yeah. So if you look at like if you um, you have a VH, uh, VHDX for your profile and your OFDC, and you just do a default login. Um, with FS Logix, you, you know, it, it, your environments would vary, but you're certainly, um, what we saw was our, uh, the profile size was about two or three times bigger with, uh, with uh, uh, Citrix uh, UPL, UPM with uh, the, the container. So we didn't get into too much detail. We'd have to go back and, you know, dig into the, to the you know, into the weeds to figure out exactly why, but it, it was higher. And there were some other issues with um, folder exemptions not working with WEM. And yeah, it, it seems like I I like 
having for me um, the director integration, which should also be possible, is nice that you can have, and the fact that you know you're kind of keeping everything in the same family. FS Logics obviously was not designed; um, it was kind of designed for RDS at the time, and then people repurposed it for um, for Citrix workloads. So I would like to see the Citrix product um, get better, and I'm not giving up on it. But as of day, as of now, as of May, I, I would I would I would go with FS Logics. It's also a bit, lot better documented in um, Slack <laughs> and the user community. Yeah. Okay, that it? That's all of them so far. You carry on, mate. All right, cool. Um, so as far as I just covered the documentation stuff. So here, here's the, um, if you can remember what I'm saying, if you're doing any implementations recently, or you can, you can go back to my blog post. Um, this is what I said for if your time. So, so if you're doing an implementation and you have um, a week, I've done some where I had uh, eight hours or something. You know, like sometimes you never know how long you're going to be in an environment. Um, you're doing an audit uh, for a client that got hacked or something. You, you don't really know, right? So, um, I broke it into the into the two parts. So. This is one, this is a, this one will get you. Like I'm sure lots of, we have a hundred and almost hundred, almost hundred fifty people on the call. What group gives me this icon? That's like a classic, right? People forget this all the time. And I don't really get this anymore because I document it in everywhere I work. But if you're in a, if you're doing an implementation for a customer, uh, you set up storefront, you set up delivery controllers, SQL, the service accounts, all that sort of stuff. Um, the bare minimum, first thing you got to do day one is give them the Active Directory group, which associates the users to the icon, right? To the uh, desktop or the published app or whatever. You got to give them that because if you have to make them dig for it and you have some, you know, naming structures are all over the place. You may be working in an environment where you have to follow the corporate naming structure or maybe you can come up with your own. So you got to write it down. Don't make them guess. Write it down. Put it on uh, Wiki, Teams Wiki, uh, Jira. OneNote, whatever. Um, same thing. I don't get this question so much in um, 2021, but in in uh, a couple of years ago when I was doing an implementation for a client, we had um, six golden images. So, and the naming uh, convention changed a little bit throughout the first year of the project. So all that stuff had to be mapped out. Uh, if you don't map that out, you're, you're making people look through Nutanix or VMware to find the master or the golden image names. Write it down. Uh, same thing for these guys. So map the servers. And then if you have scheduled tasks that run under service account names, map them. Write them down. Uh, this one's pretty simple. I mean, it's easy enough to get... Uh, the storefront URL, if you are a Citrix administrator, you go in, you get the, you know, the the store name or whatever. But your help desk sometimes wants to say, oh, how do I, how do the clients log in? Give them the names. So then if you have, so this would be like if you're there for one to two weeks. Sorry about the background noise. My uh, landlord's doing some uh, some work downstairs. Um, and then and then I go into some more detail here. Um, so so I've I've been fortunate that a lot of the work that I've been able to do over the past 21 years, I've been in category two, greater amounts of time. So I've had all of the time to do all the short amount of stuff. And then even with the example I gave at the beginning of the call, I was able to revisit a client and I was able to fill in even more stuff for them, which made things super useful, including um, documentation of like, I wrote this very long, complicated user migration script, which Towards the end, even I didn't know what it did, <laughs> um, and I got a chance to document that. Um, yeah, connection flows, diagrams, that type of stuff. And then bonus points. Um, this one, I this one kind of got drilled into me from when I used to be a support admin um, for Royal Bank of Canada, and I didn't like. Uh, we had a ticketing system which was very slow and it was really, it was a lot of work just to return a ticket. Like it would take me longer, it would take longer to fill out a ticket and to send it back to the help desk than it would to like tell them how to fix it. So what I did, I made it my mission for the, I'm trying to think how many years, I was in the, the admin position for like four years and I made it like a quarterly task to create problem resolution procedures for the help desk so that I didn't get tickets. It wasn't like I didn't like, dealing with users. I like talking to people. 
I like helping people, but you don't want to get 12 tickets for, you know, how do I map this printer? Or how do I, you know, reset my profile or whatever, right? How do I run the script? So, so that's a, that is a time consuming in the short term, but it'll save you some time. But this is definitely something like, I rarely see people doing this. It's just, it's just a habit I get into from working for, uh, for World Bank. Um, so yeah, then I just, you know, I'm not gonna restate this because, uh, but there, there are some tests here. So, so this is something for the people listening to consider um, and you can answer in the questions <laughs> in the chat. Um, do you get called? Yeah, like if it's, uh, you know, after hours, you're like, oh, uh, how, how do I do that? What was the fix for that? Where is this thing? Where is that piece of documentation? Think about these. These are kind of like your, not your, kind of like your bus tests, I guess, going back to the original point. Um, do you have um, certainty that you're not going to get called back? I like, I don't mind hearing um, back from clients that I helped, but professionally, we, as consultants and Citrix EUC experts and whatnot, we should be we should endeavor to deliver sustainable implementations that keep running when we're gone. Um, and and we won't in in many of the cases, at least in my work, I don't know about you, Lee, but a lot of the work I, I may not be there um, week after week, right? And and then also vacation, <laughs> you know, like like um, like was mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, you know, we don't necessarily want to be interrupted on our vacation. You know, we know, oh, how do you launch this? How do you do that or whatever on your days off? Um, so if you if you do you you if you find that your these situations are are coming up regularly, you, you, it may be through no fault of your own. Um, you may have an implementation which is not necessarily um, sustainable in in the short term and the long term. And if you bill by the hour, uh, if, you know, maybe that's good for billable hours, but reputationally, I, um, I endeavor to deliver solutions that continue to work and the clients are happy with uh, when I'm gone. That's it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're right. And, you know, um, the, the documentation is not just for after, you know, it's the it's the backbone of the build as well. It's what ensures you have quality and you've got measures against everything. So, yeah, I exactly. just agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. Uh, is there any other uh, any other questions that came in? Uh, yeah, there's one here. It might be a bit far out, but it says, please, can you can you share documents like problem resolutions, how to prepare Windows 10, Golden Image in PBS, MCS, update process, implement Netscalers, etc. Um, I have so. When I did the Packer presentation last year, I had a separate blog post on golden image creation. So yeah, if I can get that person's name after the meeting, I can I can contact them when that. So I have, um, like most people who have a blog, I, I usually have one blog post completed and two in the can, or two or three in the pipeline, um, ready to to post. So yeah, I can I can um, I can follow up with that person. Netscale implementations. Uh no, not me. <laughs> I'm not a Netscaler guy. You go to uh, your best bet for that would be um, Carl Stallhood. Um, but uh, as far as the yeah the golden image stuff, I'm quite familiar with that. Um, MCS and PVS and um, Nutanix, etc. Yeah, VMware. So I can yeah I can I can share uh, what I have. Uh, actually, so what I did for that blog post, which I didn't complete and I will complete. I don't think I'll do a presentation on it. Um, because it's it's a bit it's been done to death, but what I had was similar to what I have here with the decision making process in the middle. So for the the Citrix components, if you're going to use WAM or app layering, so um, I talked about the different methods that you would use to install and maintain your applications on a uh, on an on an MCS or a PVS uh, gold image. So yeah, if I I'll get that person's name and I can I can follow up with them. Yeah, I think you'll get a stream of the questions. Um, have you have you ever encountered a start menu issue with Windows Server 2016 where the start menu fails to open but the search menu opens? Um, so, yes. so the, the, are they using? Uh, is this uh, what are they using for their profile management? FS Logix? Not sure. Uh, UPM. Mm, no, no, I don't think so. And, and is this where they? Um, 
they did like a, an update of uh, Windows Server from one build to another, or the the search menu overlaying? Yeah, that doesn't 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 ring a bell. I haven't done any um, work with. Uh, so this is like uh, ZenApp uh, 2016. Yeah, I can I can follow up with them. It doesn't doesn't ring a bell. Sounds like one to post to Slack. Yeah, it could be exclusions. If you've added too many exclusions, or you just haven't got the latest version of UPN. Yeah. I don't miss that about uh, UPM having to deal with all those those damn exclusions. Um, and then, have you got a YouTube channel? I mean, uh, yeah, but I think it's just like it's like my dog. It's like me playing guitar to my dog. Let's see here. I don't think it's very interesting. <laughs> um, not that's, <laughs> that's not that's not me. That's not you. Mm, no. Yeah, I don't know. What did I call it? I'm just looking here. Oh man, look at all these Owen Reynolds. Who are these people? I thought I, my parents told me I was the only one. I'm disappointed. I do, but it's not, you're not going to get anything out of it. Yeah, I literally, I think the last video I posted is me like playing guitar to my dog. It's, it's boring. Oh, they, oh, they mean like me uh, talking like I'm doing now. No, I don't record. I just do these. I just do these. Yeah, I don't. I don't do like the YouTube. Maybe they're telling me I should. I don't know. I don't know. You guys, do you guys in the chat, do you guys think I should uh, record YouTube videos? I, I guess I could. I don't know. My webcam is not very good, but and I got a good haircut recently, so I can take advantage of that until it looks terrible again. <laughs> um, there's another question here. Uh, what is Citrix practice to assign? The LUNs for Citrix hosting connections while using Citrix MCS. That number of with with more small small size LUNs or big size LUNs. Big, yeah. I actually had to do a consolidation for a client recently. It was a Visa, it was a VMware implementation, and so it used to be best practice um, to assign many many data stores and many many LUNs. And almost and actually in this case, this client almost had a one to one mapping for one LUN to one um, VMFS5 data store to one server, if you can believe it. So it's a way, way back when. I've only been doing professional services for VMware, um, not for the VMware company, but just in my company that I get, I get um, implementations and service calls for vSEN or ESXi and vSEN for a year since I got certified. But it used to be best practice a long, long time ago to have a one-to-one -one mapping between one server to one VMS data store and one LUN, which is an administratively a nightmare. <laughs> so I helped the client consolidate it. It took like whew, three or four months working on Sundays. Um, bigger is better. Storage is cheap. One, one LUN, big VMFS six data store. In this case, the client was on VMS five, which is not good. Um, yeah, that, that's that's what I would recommend. I don't I don't think there's any best practices that recommend having many many LUNs. Um, as far as performance, if you're looking to increase performance, that's more having more spinning disks on the actual back end. The the number of LUNs is doesn't make any difference as far as I'm concerned, and less is better in terms of administration. Yeah, your biggest your biggest um, your biggest overhead on MCS right is going to be the copy process between all the different LUNs when you roll out an image. So you want, you want one LUN if you can manage it um, because then you'll only be doing your update once. Exactly, because you've got, yeah, you're going to have to deal with that that copy of that's going to exist in all of your, yeah, that's actually on the exam that I wrote a couple months ago, yeah. Uh, yep. And you're getting some YouTube love here. People are saying plus one for your YouTube channel idea. So all right. you need to start a technical YouTube channel. I do play guitar, so I got to compete against this teenager from Wales here, wherever this guy's from. So yeah, okay. I'm not. I don't think I'm gonna do uh, <laughs> to guitar, but uh, yeah, okay. All right, maybe I will. Yeah, the 10 minute format. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's 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 nice. Thanks for the feedback, guys. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely look into it. Yeah, I also have a secret weapon. It's someone who's much better looking than me. So yeah, I have. Uh, I have I have coffee bean here, so you know even if I'm boring to uh, to watch, I could I could have her perched, you know, behind me while I do the videos. She's a lot she's a lot better looking than me. It's my beloved ten year old poodle. All right, any uh, are there any other questions? People have found your YouTube channel. <laughs> oh yeah, well okay yeah you know I see I'm see I'm logged into <laughs> that's the thing is I'm actually logged into my 
server where I don't have my YouTube logged in. So what did I call it? Did I call it OB Dam? I'm just looking here. My videos. It is, what is the name? Studio. Yeah, Owen Reynolds. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I posted a bunch of things that I had for sale. I'm moving. Yeah, so I'm, I'm planning to leave Montreal for Western Canada. So, uh, yeah, this YouTube channel is lame. Oh, my God. Look at this stuff. Yeah, I definitely need to improve my YouTube game. Okay, will do. That's on my list. <laughs> so finish the two blog posts and <laughs> do uh, do some YouTube videos for sure. Okay, yeah, and if people have other questions, um, you know, like what I talked about, or I would also, by the way, I didn't just do this um, presentation just to talk. I mean, I like talking, but I also wanted to get feedback, um, especially for, um, yeah, the, the, the most interesting one for me was this. Yep, so, you know, Joe Shank, literally mentioned this two months ago how do we keep track of what are the settings that we should be giving is an optimization setting relevant for the year 2016 no longer relevant for 2021 how do you make that determination does the does the vendor tell you does the community tell you and then who in the community tells you like i am a cta lee's a ctp you know we can make a decision we're just but we're just two people you know, so how do you, who's the tiebreaker? Do you do votes? You know, like that, I almost think it would be interesting to have an entire, maybe not a CUGC presentation, but have maybe like a Slack poll or maybe a Slack group where people are constantly evaluating. BISF is a good example. BISF is an indispensable tool to deliver relevant settings for non-persistent um, environments, MCS or PVS. But there's things in BISF that are, are older and legacy and might not necessarily be relevant for the year 2021. Who is the tiebreaker to decide whether those settings are um, should be stripped out? I don't know. You know, so I think that's it's an, it's an interesting discussion on its own. So if people have um, follow up questions for me on how to do it, if they can't think of something right now, um, you know, let me know. I'm, I'm interested. I may make a blog another blog post on how do we do that? Because if you don't and you're applying old janky settings, you know, your 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 clients are gonna suffer, whether they're on thin clients or full machines or MCS or PVS. You know, PVS is a good example. Like I if I have if I want to look at PVS optimizations, I'm gonna to talk to my coworker John. He's not on the call today, but uh, yeah, he's had to go through and optimize tons of our clients over again and he's and he's increased he's reduced their boot times, he's made things more reliable, you know. Um but who like it would be nice to have like a a master repo of uh, like we have the Citrix optimizer, but that's that's just one thing, you know, like that's that's not it's not the be all end all of of, uh, of settings. That's it. Cool. I think there Stephanie will be joining us shortly. Yep, here I am. <laughs> um, thanks so much. Wow, that's a lot of great. Great stuff. I think, um, Owen, I think you got to, uh, you got some pressure to uh, be a YouTuber. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about it. Yeah, I and mean, like I said, I just thought about, you know, just to put the dog up there, but um, I think <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You, well, you thanks. You have to create golden images now, Owen, okay? <laughs> <laughs> to train her to do something more than be cute and take treats. <laughs> Awesome. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Owen. Thank you, Lee. Um, that was a lot of a lot of great stuff out there today. Um, definitely um, check out um, the link I put in there. If, if somebody said they couldn't see it, so when I send the follow up email out tomorrow, I'll make sure that you have a link to the blog post in there as well. Um, and I'll send all this Q&A over to Owen. So if um, anybody needs some follow-ups, he'll be able to get back to you. Um, yep. And I think that wraps it up. So I hope everyone has a great rest of the day, wherever you are, if it's evening, afternoon. Hope you all enjoy it. And thanks again, Owen, and thanks, Lee. And thanks, yeah. everyone, for attending. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me, Stephanie. Thanks for moderating, Lee, and have, uh, have a great day, everybody. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>